Hello, this is Dr. Flight, and this segment is uh, focused on the uh, late mature, mature and the declining stage uh, of the product life cycle. And the focus of this segment will be on extending sales volume in particular um, within a market uh, and uh, during the during the late mature mature stage and we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about survival in the decline stage and uh, interestingly enough there are some firms that prefer to be in the decline stage and actually find growth in the, in the decline stage as well it's not typical um, but uh, this segment though talks about uh, the the end of the product life cycle um, and some strategies and some thoughts about uh, surviving that period the mature and the declining um, uh, market phases uh, are, are um, challenging because uh, the enthusiasm for the product may uh, have declined and uh, companies have to find ways to separate themselves, differentiate themselves, but at the same time they have to find ways to energize the, um, the, the marketplace. So in the past, um, there have been strategies that have helped defend them, that helped firms defend themselves uh, from competition. Um, and so instead of being super aggressive uh, with direct competition, um, sometimes they retreat back to a fortress defense. Um, so we focus on keeping our customers happy and keeping our customers, our customers, in a fortress defense. So we're focused on customer satisfaction and loyalty, and we want to uh, encourage repeat purchasing. So we may not necessarily be uh, focused on increasing our market share um, necessarily, and we might not be focused on uh, selective demand issues um, like we were in the past, um, but we want to protect what's ours, and uh, there's consistency in doing that. There's also uh, a lot of uncertainty that's created in doing that too, which makes for stable, stable environments. Um, we may want to uh, buttress our primary products with flanker products or flanker brands. Another thing we might want to consider doing um, at this point in the mature and declining stages is to retreat uh, into um, some niche markets. So uh, instead of then uh, being focused on the generic or larger market segments, what we might want to do is scale back um, and really just identify the most profitable market segments. Um, and we might even want to co um, contract or withdraw from some market segments that are less profitable to focus on more niche markets at this point in time. Um, so, so that, you know, we're just in a different phase now when we're talking about maturity uh, and, and decline. Um, there still may be some opportunities to uh, grow volume. And we're not ta necessarily talking about market share per se, but units sold. Um, we want to increase penetration. Um, if there are still laggards, um, you know, because we're in, in the mature stage, we're going to have late adopters which represent 34% of the, of the buying market. So we still have a lot of consumers that haven't purchased our product for the first time. And then eventually we're gonna have laggards who of course haven't purchased either. Um, so we're still talking about, you know, 40 or 50% of the market once we hit, once we get in, you know, well into maturity that haven't bought the product yet. So it's not like a, a case where, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a case where the market's dead um, and that we're completely uh, divesting at this particular point. So we want to continue to think about uh, how much, how many units we sell, even though our, our, our market share may not be growing, we still want to focus on that. So uh, continue to enhance our product's value. We uh, know that we want to uh, be able to augment the product, adding features and benefits and especially services. Um, and we want to be able to make sure that our product works with all the other products that we're, we're, we're offering. 
Um, so, so there is this idea that um, there are still people in the marketplace that haven't bought the product yet. Um, so we want to be able to seek them out and try to reach them as much as possible. Another thing that we want to continue to do is encourage people to buy our product more often and more frequently and increase our repeat purchase rate. Um, so we want to increase the frequency uh, in which our current customers buy our products. We want to uh, be able to reposition our product for other uses, so encourage a wider, wider variety of uses for our products among current users. So if we can find new ways customers can use our product, it gives them more reason to buy. Um, more frequently. So that's certainly something that we'll want to do. We want to encourage our consumers to buy in greater volume. Um, we want to stress our benefits of our product as they use it. Of course, we continue to do that. Developing line extensions um, and, of course, promoting the new uses, which we've already talked about, is a nice way to extend the life of a product. Plus, it creates some energy and excitement around the product when a new um, product line uh, that carries our brand's name or 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 piggybacks off of our brand technology or current product technology um, can be real helpful to extend the life of a product or product line and again, grow volume. Uh, if we offer many different versions, for instance, of the product um, and we add some new techniques or, or, or specialties to the product, that, that could be helpful as well. So again, uh, sales promotions, advertising these new uses, these new products that we're developing, encouraging um, consumers to buy more and more volume and more frequently. That's going to help us during this particular during this particular stage. Another feature that we can think about uh, in maturity is uh, other ways and other places that we can sell our products. Um, so being able to take our product, change it up slightly and, and put it into a new market segment um, that is underserved or undertapped um, would certainly be something that we, we could consider doing at this point in time. Um, if we uh, do change the product uh, by making line extensions or additions or changes, then that uh, potentially opens up a new market that we could sell the product product in. Um, so variations of the product will not only serve your current market better, but it'll also uh, allow you to bring that product to a different group of consumers potentially. Um, and again, that's a way we can grow volume um, and, 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 and so forth. So one idea to consider, imagine that you are a um, producer of say a um, I don't know you're 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 a producer of a of, of a grocery item like a food uh, a food stuff and you're producing your product and you have market share and then let's say a grocery chain comes to you and wants to private label and so basically what's going to happen is you'll produce the product but you'll put the grocery stores label on the product and the grocery store's brand will sit on the shelf right next to your brand. And you might be, well, you know, like that's direct competition. I'm not sure I want to do that. But then you start to think, well, look, I'm boosting my sales volume considerably. Um, one is at a wholesale level um, and one is at a retail level. Um, it, it maintains my um, capacity, uh, so I'm, I'm utilizing my, my firm's uh, capacity, which is driving down my per unit cost because I'm reaching more efficient scales of production. And so, um, so this is a way I can grow volume um, and, um, and, and, and it's a private label offering. We, and when we think about branding, we kind of think about these lines. It's a good strategy to have. It's not a bad strategy at all to have. Um, so we think about growing multiple line extensions, uh, consider producing uh, more products like we've been talking about, design advertising uh, that will uh, grow volume for you uh, as well. Uh, Increasing different distribution channels. So it might be that right now I sell the product uh, in retail stores. 
uh, but maybe I allow for uh, the sale of my product in online venues. So now it's a different distribution channel. Now I'm selling online and selling directly to the customer. I'm going to be able to boost sales volume by by doing that. It's certainly something we can do. Uh, so different servicing programs can be designed as well. And importantly, expanding to potential global markets is an opportunity as well. So, so here's the thing. If the product is new to a market, then it's like you're starting the product lifecycle over again. So you, you know, you may be in the mature stage of your product life cycle domestically. When you bring the product um, to a to a foreign market, it's like you're starting the product life cycle over again for that product in that market. Um, so that again um, extends the life of your production production line for this particular product. Finally, though, when we're going to move into declining markets, um, the goals here will be will be to, um, to to be able to salvage profit while we can. So we want to maximize short term cash flow. Uh, we, we're going to eliminate a lot of expenses. So with this product, because remember, there are two components to earning money. There's our profit margin, but then there's also sales volume. At this point, sales volume is declining. So in order to maintain profit levels uh, or, or, or um, cash flow and so forth, if my, pro if my sales volume is lower, then what I need to do is expand my or increase my profit margin. I can't charge more price-wise, so I, my last resort then is to lower my cost. So I lower my costs as much as possible in order to maintain or increase even uh, profitability because my sales volume is going down. Okay, so I want to eliminate costs. I want to reduce marketing or reduce sales, reduce production costs. I may try to raise price um, in order to maintain margins or increase increase margins, uh, but that's you know oftentimes uh, unrealistic to be able to do that. The key growth, the the key maintenance of margin or or profit in general is going to come from reducing costs um, overall. Um, so objectives then that we have as a firm, we want to maintain um, our, our profit margin, or maintain our sales, maintain our market share for as long as we can. So we want to continue servicing programs. Uh, we want to uh, offer new ways to um, have the product uh, develop um, mo moving forward. Now, we have some idea going on here that there's an afterlife for a product or a continued life for the product. Um, continued product and process R&D expenditures. Oh, so we may stop producing the product. However, people are still using the product. Um, so there's come to a point where you actually have an afterlife of the product and you need to be able to maintain that product for a certain period of time even though you're not producing it anymore uh, people need new parts people want to have their product serviced and so on and so forth so there's going to still be some of that going on we're still going to have some maintenance or some uh, continuity in advertising although this is going to be declining more and more and more as we move forward. Um, here, focusing on Salesforce efforts is certainly something we're going to continue to do. But again, we want to maintain accounts and we want to try to get uh, as much out of the product as we can before we uh, sell it off um, or discontinue the product uh, completely. All right, so the last area here to think about in a declining market then will uh, be a notion called the profitable sur survivor. So there are some companies um, that actually thrive in the decline stage of the product life cycle. Um, think about how much you like risk. So are you a very risky person? Do you like to go out on a ledge? Do you like to, I mean, are you the first person to go bungee jumping or, or jumping out of a plane? Are you the first person to try something new or are you um, more reserved? Would you like to see somebody else 
try the bungee jump before you do just to make sure it works. Would you like to um, get lots and lots of reviews about a new restaurant from maybe your friends before you actually go there and try it yourself? Are you less risk averse? In other words, and would you like more stability and uncertainty? Now, whenever there's uncertainty, I mean, are you the person who's going to take your investments and put them into certificates of deposit, or are you going to put it into high risk um, international stocks? If you're the CD person, if you're if you are less risk loving, more risk averse, then uh, that's the type of company that may actually thrive in the mature and decline stages of the product life cycle. So there are actually companies that have product portfolios that focus on declining markets. And if you think about it, you know, there's still a good portion of the market to be had in the in the decline stage. Laggards still represent a good portion of the market. 16% of the market is made up of laggards, which means 16% of the market is still willing to buy the product. And think about this, virtually all the cost associated with the product has been paid for by previous purchasers. So at this point, the product is known, it's, people are aware of it, um, there's still people buying the product, but the cost to maintain the product and to actually offer the product um, are lower and lower and lower, yet there's still profit out there to be had. So there are um, there are folks and companies out there that want to stay in a declining market and they actually want to grow um, share and they want to grow grow sales in that particular market. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here. Um, we want to be able to um, you know, still be aggressive with our competitors, signaling to them our intent. We um, may want to introduce a new line, even in an extended, in, in, in a declining market. And we might want to act very competitively um, in, in this marketplace because, you know, at least for the remaining life, of the product, there's still customers who want to buy it. So this is a little counterintuitive. Um, you might not think this way uh, because all we're geared towards thinking, we're, we're conditioned to think growth, 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 and that's where you want to be. Um, some people don't realize, a contrarian may suggest that you can still grow even in a declining market. And also this growth is possible because you have so many other firms wanting to get out. Um, so that is something to consider as a as an exit strategy or as a strategy towards the end of the product life cycle um, to to consider um, and and if you are very risk averse if you are um, you know not fond of product failures and so on and so forth or market failures. Um, then this is certainly an area uh, to consider in terms of your por product portfolio and where you have um, your products your products uh, arranged. Okay. So finally, just to um, conclude, then um, there are uh, there there are strategies that we can think about in the mature market um, to to grow and to increase our um, our, our volume, sales volume in particular. Um, and then surviving the decline stage uh, is a nuanced and kind of an interesting concept that, uh, that we talked about a little bit. Um, certainly, this is not a strategy most firms engage in. Um, it's not something that they follow um, necessarily as a, uh, a firm strategy, um, but there are some companies that do that. And so this wraps up then the decline stage and the product life cycle discussion.